Good evening, good evening, and a hearty blessing to you and yours this wonderful Wednesday evening in which the Lord gives us the opportunity and privilege to come in his name to glorify him and to learn of his will and purpose for our lives. We're so wonderfully blessed to be able to do so. And Elder Douglas, as we welcome our dear souls, would you mind praying for us? Um, I don't mind at all, Elder. Thanks be to God that he gives us this moment to do so and invite us all the time that we can come to him. I want to add my word of welcome to yours to say for everyone who tune in tonight, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for choosing this moment and this time to spend again at the feet of Jesus. So we welcome you again tonight. Amen. To our Bible study. I invite you to join me now as we offer a word of prayer to our creator. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your keeping care throughout another day. Lord, it's only because you allow us to be here at this moment that we are here, Lord. We thank you for the breath of life and we thank you, Lord, that in spite of our nothingness, you have led us to this point so that we can call upon you. And at this point where we can speak the word only by your guidance. So tonight, Father, we ask for your divine anointing. May you speak through us, Father, to your people and do your own conviction. Have thine own way, Lord God. It is a subject that we know that sometimes it's in dispute. But Lord God, your word stands forever and ever and is done in truth and uprightness. So we look only to you, Father, and we thank you again. Father, tonight in a special way, we call upon you to remember the cousin of Elder Lightbody who was in an auto accident. We ask your Father to continue to grant divine healing. We ask that you will continue to be with him and his family and the entire family and relatives, Lord, as they continue to look to thee because you bring healing, Father. Remember our dear sister Davis again tonight, Lord. We ask that you will be with her, Father, oh God. Grant her your healing touch upon her hand, oh God. We ask that you will lead her and guide her and protect her, Father. Lord, remember Brother Benjamin tonight. We ask that you may cover him under your precious wings, that you may continue to touch him, Lord, with the touch that comes only from you. Father, we ask the same for our dear sister McGee. Be with her, mighty God. We thank you that you have allowed her again to be out of the hospital. Please, my Father, continue to grant her your healing, protecting care, and above all, keep our heart and our mind steadfast upon thee. We pray for the entire family members, Father, that you may cover them. Keep them, Lord, throughout every situation. We ask that you will give them the strength and the courage, Lord, as they press on with their beloved mother who is ill. Father, we ask that you will continue to be with Sister Jesoda Hines. May you help her, Lord. May you cover her. May you grant her your healing touch, Father. May you keep her steadfast and true to thee. Thank you, O oh God, for the joy family. Lord, oh God, we see Brother Dujoy who came to church on Sabbath and we are so thankful, Lord, for you alone could bring that to pass. We thank you. May you bless the entire family. We ask you tonight, oh God, to remember our dear Elder Randall, his sister-in-law who is in the hospital. Lord, we ask for your divine touch, your divine visit, Lord, for we know that there is nothing that is impossible with thee. So we ask for a healing touch and the daughter-in-law in Virginia as well, Father. We ask for your healing touch. And we ask that you will be with the entire Randall family, O oh God, and the extended family continue to cover them under your precious wings. Father, we ask that you will speak through us tonight. Have thine own way, Lord. Remember our beloved Andrew. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you have placed that willingness in his heart to be on this platform whereby he can allow us to speak, Lord, so that others can hear us and glorify your name. 
So continue to be with him, Father. Continue to lead him day by day, almighty God. Lead him and lead his brother and lead his mother and his father. Continue to cover them under your precious wings, oh God. And I ask the same for all the family members, extended family relatives, everyone with whom they come in contact, may they see Jesus. Father, we ask for your blessing upon us for this another night. We ask for your blessing upon all those who will tune in tonight, Lord. Be with each and every one of their family, Lord, and family members, Father. And may they hear something that will cause them to turn to you, something that will cause them to solidify their relationship with you, something that will give them encouragement, Lord, to press on, knowing that we have a Redeemer, we have a Savior, and we have a King. Thank you, Lord. Be in our midst and take full control as we surrender to you. In the word, the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, Brother Randall will bring us our scripture reading. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Elder. And tonight, our, our main scripture reading is from Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 4 through 6. And I'm going to be reading the NIV version. Verse 4. It is not for kings, Lemuel. Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to clear, clear beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord and blessed be the word of the Lord. At this time now we are going to do our opening song. And I chose that this evening I was thinking about it and, you know, I was, I said, Lord, Somehow I feel like this song is so, so, you know, whenever we are feeling down, they, we remember that there is victory in Jesus. And so I chose to sing this song tonight. Join me if you know it. We usually sing it on the choir. I heard an old, old story, how the Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. And bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought me to the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He sought me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Yes, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the clouds.
cleansing flood. Praise the Lord. There is victory in Amen. Jesus. Amen. Victory surely comes in the name of Jesus. And now we'll sing number 647. Hymn number 647. Number 647, which says, Mine eyes have seen the glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Brother Randall, over to you, my brother. Amen. His truth is marching on. One of my favorites as a kid, which had been a few moons ago, but that was one of my favorites as his truth goes marching on. My dear brothers and sisters, we're so happy to be with you this evening, but to talk about something that's very, very serious. And uh, as we read, and I'm going to reread again, Proverbs 31, 4 to 6, it says, it is not for kings, the Muriel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to clay, clave beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Some have interpreted scripture to mean that it's just for rulers to not drink. For everybody else, when they get sad and deprived, uh, it's okay. But no, folks, what this is saying is that, number one, if we're going to have good judgment, not just rulers, we're going to have good judgment, we need to stay away if we're going to do the right thing at all times. And if we are kind of lost in ourselves, we can end up on a course that will take us to a perishing state. And I'd like to share with you the word addiction. Addiction. Something that uh, the only thing that it would be good for us to be addicted to would be to serve the Lord our God. That's the addiction that we need in our lives today. Uh, doing a quick Google search, it turns out that thousands of uh, results from the harm caused by addictions, whether tobacco, alcohol, harmful drugs, or even game consoles or cell phones. The rise of the addiction recovery industry in the United States is but one sign of its scale. The human toil from within families, businesses, communities resulting from its destruction is another. Hardly a day passes when there isn't a news report of an overdose death, another family ripped apart by the results of addiction, or the tragic loss of life at the hands of a drunk driver. The human cause of tobacco addiction is almost immeasurable, as those who've seen a loved one struggle with lung cancer or the combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, referred to as COPD, sadly attest. Our prophetess, Ellen White, did not live to see today's opiate epidemic or the tragedies of drunk driving on the world's highways. But she was shown, however, that tobacco, drugs, alcohol were not substances to be trifled with. She wrote the following, Elder. She said, on every side, Satan seeks to entice the youth into the path of perdition. And if he can once get their feet set in the way, he hurries them on in their downward course, leading them from one dissipation to another until his victims lose their tenderness of conscience and have no more fear of God before their eyes. They exercise less and less, uh, less, less self-restraint 
they become addicted to the use of wine and alcohol, tobacco and opium, and go from one stage of debasement to another. They are slaves to appetite. Counsel which they once respected, they learn to despise. They put on swaggering airs and boasts of liberty when they are the servants of corruption. They mean by liberty that they are slaves to selfishness, debased appetite, and licentiousness. Elder, how does that strike you in this day and time? Addiction, addiction, a curse to mankind. Um, good evening again, everyone. Um, there's so much that is involved in it. I want to welcome everybody here tonight. Sister Catherine Boyd, Sister Evadne Brown, Sister Kendock, Elder Lightbody, Rich Henry, bless the Lord, Angela Kendock, oh, I see her, Sister Gamel Trim, and Pamela Russell. These are the names I see, but I welcome all of you to tonight. Thanks for joining. I just hit the comment and see all these wonderful people who are faithful and true online Amen. tonight. So I just want to acknowledge you, Sister Sims. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us, and the glory be unto God. And Sister Sakira, bless the Lord. So at this time, as we think on the subject of alcohol, we know that's a subject that not everybody agrees that you should or shouldn't drink with alcohol. But we look on the word of God, into the word of God, and see what the word of God has to say about it tonight. And one of the things that the Lord had instructed, specifically give instruction to his people, when we look at Aaron, he told Aaron and his sons, the priests, that they were forbidden to drink either wine or strong drink when they went into the tabernacle to minister before the Lord. So the Lord is telling them, listen, stay away from that because the Lord who knows, know the effects it can have. And as we look in Leviticus 10 and verse 8, we see whereby the Lord said unto Aaron, Verse 9, do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. So, and he said in verse 10, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. So as we look at it, we see whereby the Lord is giving instruction about strong drink. And I, I, as I was studying earlier, Elder, I see whereby wine was referred to as the cluster. There is a new wine that the Bible said that is found in the cluster, which is a fresh grape that is picked from the tree. So that was referenced as wine in the Bible. So there is a new wine and then there is the fermented wine. Now the new wine, we know that that doesn't do anything to us in terms of it's helpful. But we know that there is a fermented wine that will alter our senses. And so God, and is not only altering our senses, you have seen so much devastation that indulging in a strong drink can do. Amen. And, and that's an important distinction because the fruit of the vine, of the grape, is uh, excellent, healthy, and, and beneficial uh, drink. But it's the fruit of it, and as you said, unfermented. And in the Bible, uh, the word uh, that's translated wine happens to refer to evil one. Uh, you know, so when it's being used there, uh, the, dip, the, the dip key difference there, like when Jesus uh, uh, made wine, per se, it was the fruit. And, and it was the grape juice, freshly squeezed grapes. It was not fermented, okay? And that's a big difference. And, you know, grape juice is very good. But uh, grape wine, the Lord says what? It's a marker, okay? How, how's, it, how's the Bible read it? It says... Wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So we're not wise if we take these beverages in the fermented condition. 
in no way is the Lord, good Lord promoting, suggesting, or offering that to his people. He's saying everything he can to lead us away, uh, away from, indeed, alcoholic beverage or anything that, uh, uh, let, let me uh, read from, uh, Ellen White wrote, uh, wrote in 1891, says moderate drinking is the school in which men are receiving an education for the drunkard's career. So gradually does Satan lead away from the stronghold of temperance. And of course, temperance was the movement that she helped lead to lead people away from and stay away from drinking strong drink. So insidiously do wine and cider, was that word? Cider exert, exert their influence upon the taste that the highway to drunkenness is entered upon all unsuspectingly. The taste for stimulants is cultivated. The nervous system is disordered. So we put our, our nervous system, our body in, uh, in jeopardy, uh, exposed much more easily to the wiles of the devil to take us astray and in the process literally do what destroy our health destroy our mental capacity to commune with god and ultimately destroy our lives forever so elder god you know the liquor industry uh, that pushes these things uh, upon humans for what? The almighty dollar. The almighty dollar uh, is, the dollar is not the problem. It's the man who falls in love with what he believes or he, she believes the dollar will do for them. And so this scripture pictures the work of those who manufacture and who sell intoxicating liquor. Their business means robbery. For the money they receive, no equivalent is returned. Every dollar they add to their gains has brought a curse to the spender. A curse. Yes, and so there, there are people who drink wine and they tell you that, you know, you, you need to take a little for the stomach's sake. The wine is good for the stomach's sake. And that is a very common term that I hear people use, that, you know, you have to drink a little wine. And I am not here to condemn anyone, you know. I can just look in the word of God and what it says to me, I go by that. And so as we continue to look at what the Lord says about it, there are so many references in the Bible whereby the Lord is giving a warning against strong liquor, strong wine, strong drink, he, he would mention. As we look also in uh, ch chapter 6 of Numbers, we see whereby the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, that means you're going to vow a vow, you have to be in your right mind to make a vow. It's to separate themselves unto the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist. Moist grapes are dried. So it's, it's really telling us that once we reach into the stages where it's going into fermentation, the Lord himself is admonishing, listen, stay away from that, you know? And I believe that the Lord would have us to make intelligent decisions, especially when we have to vow a vow and he's letting them know that. As you vow your vow before me, you need clarity of mind. But it's not going to go for just an instant in time whereby you're just going to come and say, you know, I'm not going to drink any wine tonight because I'm going mm. to talk to the Lord. It's a lifestyle. It's a Amen. practice of a lifestyle. And for some, it might not be an easy thing to do. But we, as we, the Lord invite us, he said, ask and it shall be given so once we realize it's something in his word that he tells us that 
listen, stay away from this, then the power is in him to grant us that power to withstand that temptation to take a little wine here, take a little wine there. Because I am sure that many people, that's how they started out. Just take a little here and take a little there. And before you know it, they become addicted and they cannot get themselves off of it. So yeah. it's best to avoid it at all costs and trust to God, you know, that he will give you that power over Amen. alcohol and anything else that would destroy our bodies, which is the temple of the living God. Amen. And dear lady, the uh, pen of inspiration uh, was penned and it said the following, the Bible nowhere sanctions the use of intoxicating wine. The wine that Christ made from water at the marriage feast of Cana was the pure grape, the pure juice of the grape. This is the new wine, the pure what? Juice of the grape, not fermented, found in the cluster of which the scripture says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So the pure juice of the grape and the, uh, the new wine found in a cluster, this we do not destroy or get rid of. We take it because that indeed offers a blessing. Now, you know, Elder, uh, I, I just want to introduce something else to us tonight. You know, uh, when we talk about alcohol and addiction, you know, we, 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 we think about these things, but addiction, of course, to anything is bad. And one of the things that also the inspiration of the pen of Ellen White wrote about was about coffee. Coffee. All right. And what did she say about coffee? Well. How should we equate with coffee? Or oh, for a hundred years, Seven Day Adventists stood out as social oddities because we did not smoke. But by accepting the insights of church co-founder Ellen G. White, we were spared now uh, the now well-known major health issues of tobacco that tobacco causes. Today, the world would finally, has finally caught up with us on tobacco. It even recognizes the benefits of an alcohol-free and meat-free lifestyle. But there's one area of health that finds society moving in precisely the opposite direction from Adventist teachings. And, you know, and a lot of people may not know that this is an Adventist teaching. In some societies, four out of five adults drink coffee. Many of those who don't drink tea, I'm sorry, who don't drink tea or caffeinated soft drinks. This use of caffeine is not generally viewed as a health concern by contemporary society. Rather, it's celebrated as the news uh, website, NewZealand.com, uh, all the way from uh, New Zealand. It said, in the last couple of decades, New Zealand has undergone a coffee revelation as many Kiwis have become connoisseurs of their favorite black beverage for more than 100 years. Ellen White advised against caffeine. She said the following. For Ellen White, using caffeine and coffee as a beverage is a sin, an injurious indulgence. According to the comprehensive book, The Prophet's, Prophet's Prophetic Ministry of Ellen G. White, after the immediate stimulating effect, a feeling of depression sets in. With continual use, the abuser of the nervous system will experience headaches, wakefulness, palpitations of the heart, indigestion, trembling, and many other uh, evils. For they, what are they? Tea, coffee, and many other popular drinks wear away the life forces. Both tea and coffee are what? Poisonous and Christians should let them alone. That's quite a statement. And I just want to share one other thing before you comment, dear lady, and that is I got a little surprise about where 
the coffee bean came from. It came from Ethiopia in the ninth century. It was originally known as the wind of the bean because it was used to circumvent the Muslim prohibition against alcohol. It became an essential part of the performance-driven religious behavior of the whirling dervishes associated with mystical Sufi branch of Islam. Christian churches, churches originally outlawed it, but in the year 1600, the Pope blessed its use. Even as caffeine is being embraced as the fuel necessary to sustain our culture 20, uh, 24-7, the science, scientific evidence, although at times contradictory, continues to raise questions and concerns, and it, and it isn't looking good for coffee. You know, it's, it's really tragic that we have adopted the very things that God knows is nothing but a poison and used against us. And it's very interesting that caffeine was considered by the Islam faith as a way around the prohibition of drinking alcohol. And why? Because you also become addicted to the caffeine, just like you become addicted to the alcohol. And it also destroys your body and destroys your health. And so man somehow always seeks a path around God's blessings to try to save us from sin and de degradation. And so it's really sad, sister, to realize that we somehow always try to circumvent God's blessings. You know, Elder, it's interesting that you read about, I, I never knew about the coffee I I know I do not drink coffee because of the um, caffeine that is in it, but there are people who they tell you that there is nothing wrong in drinking coffee. Um, that is new knowledge that you have brought to us tonight. I guess there are others who know about it because it's something that is written, but I did not know about that aspect of it, you know, the historical as aspect of it. But what I want to look at is that the major thing that the devil wants to do is to alter our senses so that we do not seek the lord and that we do not worship our creator as we ought to and as elder lightbody says that fermented drinks impair the judgment it is impossible to serve the lord intelligently if the mind or judgment is impaired and we see that all around us we see even how much like drinking too much or even drinking at all because as we said people use the excuse that they do not drink too much as an excuse to actually drink a little bit here and there but they said it's not the same day that the leaf fall into the water that it goes bad so it's here a little there a little and gradually before you know it even the person who become addicted will be remain in denial and you know that even with alcoholic anonymous they cannot offer any kind of cure until you acknowledge that you are addicted to something and so it's the the onus is on us to as the lord impart knowledge to us we do not have to get into a defensive mode because we know that of ourselves we can do no good thing but we know that we have a savior, we have a Lord who gives us power over every unrighteousness, the seen Amen. and the unseen. Yes, it's a lot of course, the seen and the unseen. You see? And Elder, the, the yes, good sir. Lord is not trying to hurt our feelings wow. or make us feel bad when he warns of these, of, of these things. He's trying to indeed help us, to bless us, so that we will not only not feel bad about sinning, but that we will be in, because remember, our relationship with him is based on our what? Choosing to do what? Die to self and to allow Jesus to come in and live in us and through us. But it's got to be our choice. He won't force it. What's the devil's plan? Alter the mind so it cannot make such a decision. And what alcohol, caffeine, 
uh, or whatever else might be addictive, it's not just uh, some, a little of it is bad. Once it takes over, then we become under whose power? Under Satan's power. Because the good Lord is no longer able to uh, communicate as he would like to. It's a real battle. Not that it never can, he can never get through, but it just, we just make an already hard fight much, much worse. But we make it easy for the devil to do what? To help many of us. There are literally millions of, of us perishing because our minds have been altered by these things that addict us and that make us easy victims and targets for Satan. Amen. Amen. And we see we are by in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. And as we look over in Proverbs 23 and verse 29, we see it says here, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine... They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. You see, and then it goes on to say, Thine eye shall behold strange woman, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So you see, the Lord is just, it's uh, over and over, we see where the, the warning is given to us that it's not something that we should indulge in. You know, if we want to, because in, if the Lord seeks for us, you spoke earlier about making the choice. And we can only make intelligent choice of choosing the Lord as our intellect is clear to do so. Amen. And we, when we... In, put in alcohol in our bodies, it impair our judgment. And how can we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth in that way? And Jesus Elder, said, there's, a, there's a young okay. man named Andrew Nelson, who's an uh, Adventist medical student at Loma Linda University, who did some studies on this as well. And I just want to read two uh, statements. One of them is, is from Ellen White that he shared. And he says that caffeine, and the title of it is The Caffeine Crisis, The per Percolation of a Stimulating Conversation. I love that title, The Percolation of a Stimulating Conversation. Caffeine seems to be everywhere in our modern world. Coffee, tea, sodas, energy drinks, hot chocolate. Now, you mentioned, he mentioned hot chocolate. Guess who loves hot chocolate? <laughs> uh, okay, wait a minute. And medicines all contain caffeine. On the surface, they seem harmless. Who doesn't eat chocolate every once in a while? Coffee st establishments are flourishing as customers order cups of coffee, espresso, and other drinks. Drinking coffee often sets the scene for social gatherings. Many people driving late at night stop for the, that cup of coffee to keep them awake. Students who stay up all night studying may get the espresso to gain a few more hours of study. And he takes the following from Ellen White to discuss coffee. Who discussed it? Ellen White, coffee and tea rather than caffeine. The word coffee appears 549 times in her writing and tea 586 times. Coffee and tea are used together, together now 515 times. She does not uh, talk about coffee or cola. I'm sorry, chocolate or cola. Ellen White discussed the effect of caffeine on the mind, saying that it decreases brain activity, although it temporarily, <coughs> excuse me, excites and increases energy with acute ca caffeine use. Furthermore, she real realized the problem with chronic use. She said this about coffee and tea. Tea is an, has an influence to excite the nerves, and coffee benumbs the brain. What does it do? Benumbs the brain. Both are highly injurious. 
you should be careful of your diet. In other words, folks, it would pay. What did she go out and say? On several occasions, Ellen White drank green and black tea when she was sick. But other than these rare, rare exceptions, she did not drink coffee or caffeinated tea or keep it in her house. She occasionally used catnip, red clover, blossom, hop, and, uh, and beef tea, all non-caffeinated drinks. So caffeine is a destroyer. What does it say? Benumbs. And once it benumbs, what does it benumb mean? It, it, that means that you, you're not going to be able to make rational decisions. You're not functioning. Right. It's, it's, it's bad. Right. And Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. In John 10 and verse 10. So by using alcohol, we participate in destroying not only our own life, but often the lives of others. Even in moderation, alcohol use causes significant problems, physically, mentally, and spiritually. It's no wonder the Bible consistently warns against it. God says in Isaiah 1 and verse 18, come now and let us reason together. With alcohol use, we temporarily and permanently stupefy our reasoning powers. So for a Christian, is it drinkable? or unthinkable it's really the lord give us a choice there is a freedom of choice and we are not here to try to force anyone to say do this or do that we can only tell what the word of god says the spirit of god that does the conviction but as we read in his word and as we prayerfully search the scripture and we ask him to lead and guide us he, as I said, gives us the power over every unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've been through, through seeing situations whereby people's lives, the Bible can never lie. People's lives become torn into pieces because of addiction to alcohol. There are people who, the, I have actually seen somebody who drank alcohol and stand before me and telling me that okay i'm gonna speak in tongues to you tonight mm. and that person is speaking in tongues in with alcohol and i'm not here to knock tongues you know because i i just i will not go into that territory i'm just saying that alcohol really has an effect on the system that it can ruin not only your life not only my life but it has a domino effect whereby different family members are affected. It's like even gambling, which um, was discussed last week. You see there are sometimes mouths to feed and you have family members who are addicted to these different things. And because of that, their very own end up suffering because of it. So if something... He, in god's promises that he come that we may have life and have it more abundantly so to be in that state is not god's plan for us amen, amen. it was never his plan for us and welcome elder, to you sister monica tyrell god blessing to you elder and, yes and elder, elder one of the things also there are many people who really want to drink or partake of the things that God said we shouldn't. So they try to find, they think what things in the Bible which would refute it, especially this thing about wine, right? Uh, they say because it would have been almost impossible in that day for them to uh, uh, not allow the fruit of the grape or the apple, whatever they might have been make, making the wine out of, to ferment. And yet, even in biblical times, they did have a number of different ways to prevent fermentation. And I think it's important for people to understand that, that uh, they were able to partake of the fruit of the vine and, and it not ferment. And, and for some period of time, I don't know if it was many, 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 many days, but 
for a, 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 a point in time for some of them. Yes, let me share uh, some of these would be many, many days. One method involved boiling the juice and reducing it to a syrup that would later be diluted with water. In other words, make it into a syrup uh, and uh, add some water and you have the fruit of the, the vine, okay? Unfermented. Another was to boil the juice with minimum ex evaporation and then immediately seal it with beeswax and airtight jars. Clamp it down, airtight, unfermented, until you take it out. And what do you do? Add a little water. Two, three, drying the fruit in the sun and then reconstituting it with water. Adding sulfur to the fruit juice or filtering the juice to extract the gluten were also methods that would prevent the juice from fermenting. So they had a number of ways that they could and notice, you know, unlike what I originally said, really, they could keep for a while. And all they had to do is add water. And, uh, and unfermented wine in ancient literature, it tells us that referring to reconstituting grape syrup to make grape juice, Aristotle, very famous man, who was born around 384 BC, wrote the wine of Arcadia was so thick that it was necessary to scrape it from the skin bottles in which it was contained and dissolved the scrapings in water. The and it then went on to some. There is no wine sweeter to drink than that of Lesbos, is what it's called. It was like nectar and would not produce intoxication. Didn't ferment. So they did have ways of utilizing the fruit of the vine. In this case, the fruit of the grape for a long, long time, unfermented. So that that little story also is debunked. There were ways, uh, and, you know, boiling, wow. I mean, that's, I mean, all they needed what? It's some uh, fuel in a, a little fire and they could boil it. So uh, the good Lord said, no, no, no. I have, I know what I want from my people and for them. And no way am I gonna say, that's not what they should have, and then not give them away to, to not have it. <laughs> yes, Elder. And so you see that you went back into history again into different ways and means that they could, you know, they go through to produce the 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 state of wine, bringing it to that phase whereby it alters the senses. And as our dear Elder Tyrell is saying, Christians knew that their bodies is the temple of God. Therefore, nothing that defiles the body should be put in our bodies. We should be following, thus said the Lord, the words of God is the light to our feet. See, um, oh, we agree with you 100%, Elder Tyrell. It's as, si it's as simple as that. The word of God, we... It, no matter how somebody might try to circumnavigate around the word of God, truth stands on its own. And so, as Elder Turley is saying, thus said the Lord, follow the word of God, because why? It's a light unto our feet, you see, so that we may know the pathway to go as we travel on this journey. If we look at Proverbs 31 and verse 4 to verse 8, it says, it is not for kings, Oh, Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law. There we go with altering the senses again and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. To him that is ready to perish. Isn't that serious? Strong drink to him that is ready to perish. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So you see, people will use alcohol as a way of forgetting their circumstances, their immediate circumstances. But when it wears off, they are back to square one again and then going into a cycle, being dependent upon something other than the Lord. 
Amen. The Lord placed in each and every one of us that void which can only be filled by himself. And so to choose different ways and means, and I'm not saying it's just wine. There are different things that each individual know. To, they choose to put in that place where God alone should occupy. And so as, as we become addicted to different things in our lives, then that is a way of preventing us. We are going into uncharted territory because the whole idea is that the Lord would want to restore us back to himself. And as he restore us, we have to stay away from the things that he instruct us in his word to stay away from. Welcome to you, um, sister, beloved sister Joan Gilpin. It's thank you for joining us. Back to you, Elder. Well, Elder, you know, it's, uh, again, I, I want to share this last little statement from uh, a spirit of prophecy, and then I want to I want to make a statement. It says because the mind and conscience are intimately related, Ellen White was concerned about how caffeine and other addictive substances may affect us spiritually. Affect us how spiritually? The Apostle Paul gives us this vision. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to god this is your spiritual act of worship do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but to but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what god's will is his good pleasing and perfect will what a wonderful vision paul gives us about what we can be as we understand god's will for our lives when we consider how we may better serve God and others through changes in all areas of our lifestyle, be it through less caffeine or alcohol, or even the, what do we say, the cell phone, <laughs> better nutrition, exercises, or devotions, to name a few. Following God's plan is a real joy. And I think that's our problem, Elder do we have real joy from following God or do we try to find every possible way not to do what God has instructed us for whose good, not for his good, for our good, including things like drinking wine, fermented wine. He says it's a marker. It's a bad thing. And we, and many put people or uh, uh, human beings go to the Bible to try to uh, take various scriptures to say why it's okay to have a little wine, fermented wine, why it's okay to uh, 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 violate the health laws uh, when God said don't do it. It's just so terrible. We refuse to become addicted to God, meaning to obey his will. Instead, we want to latch on to the very things that will take our will away from us, that will take our choice away from us and lead us down the road to uh, perdition and destruction and for eternal damnation. It's a shame. And I look in, in studying it, uh, for this at myself and saying, well, what choices am I making? And that's what we individually have to do in concert with jesus dear lord search me please lord search me in whatever there is that's not pleasing or that sin against you please show it to me and then help me to be wise enough to say lord please take it and invite your presence your mind asking and begging for your mind to be present in me so that my life instead will not be a curse but a blessing first to my family, then to my brothers and sisters in Christ, and into this dark world in which he still is trying to witness to to save others. May we decide we will no longer be addicted to the things of this world, but that we will indeed instead be addicted to the love of Christ and love him back as he loves us. 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You have well said that, Elder Randall. And as we look, he said, what sins? With what sins is drunken next, next class? In the Bible, we see in Galatians 5, verse 19 to 21, which says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reverence, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And when we look at, when we look at what the Lord has promised us for eternity, oh my God, the pen of inspiration said, when we get there, we'll say heaven is cheap indeed. So for there are, there are people who will fight tooth and nail to tell you they have to have their liquor. But, but when you look at the, there's a price to pay, there's a price to pay to lose, to lose their soul salvation, to lose out on what God has planned for us. It's just not worth it, Elder, not for anything. It's just not worth it. May God help us that we will endeavor to, as we recognize different things that he admonishes us in his word to do, may he give us the strength and the courage to make the conscious decision because there is a part that we have to play. We, he gives us the power of choice. And as we make that conscious decision to follow him comes what may, then he will give us the overcoming power. And we will know that it's really not of ourselves, but of him because Amen. flesh and blood cannot overcome these things. It's there to pull us away from the Lord. But as we make the choice and as we do our part in terms of making that decision and going towards that acting, putting aside, repenting of our sins. The Bible said, Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart. So by God's grace, we have to purpose in our hearts as we see in his words what is his will for our life that we will purpose in our heart not to partake and to choose him again and again. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Sister Celeste. It's beautiful of you to join us tonight. God bless you and family. Elder Rango. Thank you, dear sister. And uh, as we prepare to close our study, I, I want to invite each one here this evening, just as I, as a result of this study, been refreshed to, as I, uh, you know, confess, hot chocolate is one of my favorites with whipped cream. Mm hmm. <laughs> Well, hot chocolate got to become not one of my favorites with whipped cream. I would ask that we all need to search ourselves. And if uh, anyone, uh, well, anyway, that we search ourselves and what God has prohibited to make sure that we ask him if we have those things in our lives, that we ask him to help us to let go. And it may not even be easy in some instances, but we know one thing, he can do it for us, but we've got to choose to allow him to do it. He won't force us and he won't do it by saying, I'm not going to let you do that anymore. We have got to want to do so. So I'm going to pray now that God will help each of us to, you know, wherever it might be. And I hope and pray that none of us are dealing with alcohol uh, in the form of the drink itself. You know, uh, if we were talking some health things right now, we can produce uh, some alcohol just from what we eat in some instances. So that's a different discussion. <laughs> but the point is the wine and the alcohol and all these other things that would do us great destruction. I pray that none of us are fighting that. But if we are, this again, God is not about condemning. God is about saying, look walk ye no longer in that and if you want help call on me and i will deliver you 
That's his promise. And I know he's a keeper of his promises. Elder, you have anything else you want to say before I pray? Yes, Elder. I just would like for you to remember those who have addiction to alcohol because it's not an easy thing. It couldn't be easy for them for any kind of addiction because we covered the subject of alcohol tonight, but each and every one of us have our different addiction. So pray for the addictions in our lives and, in, and pray for those who are alcoholic so that by God's grace, we become overcomers of our addictions. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have chosen to share with us once again this truth as it is in Jesus. That addiction in any form, be it alcohol, uh, be it TV, be it the cell phone, be it playing games, whatever it might be, Lord, in any form, be it drinking coffee or eating chocolate. Help us to say thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us. So that we have a chance with your help first to rid be rid of these things that would affect our minds in such a way that we would not be able to choose, rightfully choose. We'd be our minds would be benumbed such that we would not be able to exercise choice. And the devil would continue to have his way with us. Help us to say yes to you, no to ourselves, no to the devil. And help us to plead with you for deliverance, whatever it may, the form it may take in our particular lives. Indeed, as Elder uh, Douglas has just said, whatever we may be addicted to, Lord, we ask for every soul here under the sound of my voice and for their loved ones and families and ones that they might be praying for themselves who may be addicted to one thing or another. We pray for deliverance that only can come from you and through you. And as we ask, Lord, and remember, sometimes we have to ask for those who would not ask for themselves and that you are a, a prayer answering God. And even in that case, you will answer the prayer and work for that soul. Again, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. Help us to love you back by saying yes. Jesus, have your way in me, through me, and with me. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You muted, Elder. Amen and amen. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and may you continue to have a blessed week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you all his peace, which passes all understanding. God bless you. Good night. Good night.